Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Caroline Griffin. I am Riot's Director of Operations. Welcome to the Riot Virtual Lunch and Learn Series, the place where we spotlight all of Riot's sponsors. Today, we have Rob Lauer and Brandon Satrum with us from Blues Wireless, and they will be talking to us about wireless IoT with no strings attached. Just a couple of quick reminders before we get started. This Lunch and Learn is being recorded and will be posted to Riot's YouTube channel and then uploaded to the meetup group where you signed up for this event. So you'll be able to find it later. If you have any questions throughout the event, please do place those in the chat box. We'll make sure they, um, they all get answered at the end if we have time. And then just a quick reminder to keep yourself muted throughout the event. If we have time at the end, um, we may be able to let you come off mute and ask some questions directly to Brandon and Rob. But without further ado, we're super excited to have you here with us today, and I'll hand it over to Brandon and Rob. Great. Thanks so much, Caroline. And hey, everybody, I see some uh, familiar faces. So definitely great to see some folks in here today and look forward to, uh, to a, a lively, uh, useful discussion. So before we get started, uh, Rob and I did want to take a moment and introduce ourselves. So as Caroline said, my name is Brandon. Um, I lead the developer experience and marketing teams at Blues Wireless. And my job is to ensure that our developers have everything they need to be successful with our products. Uh, previously, I was the head of DevRel at Particle, and I have 21 years of experience as an engineer, a product manager, and six years active in the IoT space. And Rob, go ahead. Yeah, hey everyone. So my name is Rob Lauer. I did just join Blues Wireless about two months ago to help lead uh, some of our DevRel developer relations efforts. Uh, in a former life, I was an engineer at the University of Wisconsin, Go Badgers, get my little shout out in the back there, and a uh, product manager slash DevRel kind of want to be at Telerik. Um, so IoT for me as a career is relatively new, but I do feel like I'm a maker at heart. And yes, I love cheese. That slide doesn't lie. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Rob. So our plan for the session today is to spend around 50 minutes of our time just walking through the general topic to talk about issues and challenges with cellular IoT talk a little bit about Blue's products, and then leave about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. And we'll sprinkle in uh, a couple of demos so that you can see our, our products in action. So first, let's talk about the strings of cellular IoT. And I, I've spent the better part of the last decade working on developer-focused hardware and software. And every product that I've worked on has existed to help developers overcome or address problems in their world. And in the IoT world, in the cellular world in particular, I call these things the strings of cellular IoT. Uh, and these are the things that developers often cannot control, uh, things that make our lives difficult, the things that slow us down, that cut off choice or provide unnecessarily unnecessary duplication of effort. And there are a lot of these things. I'm sure many of you can think of uh, many even now. But the ones that I've observed most often in this space are difficult to program modems, too narrow or too wide guardrails, pitfalls with device lifecycle management, the fact that many times security isn't baked in to the products that we use, and then the challenging and meandering path from prototype to scale. And I wanna talk briefly about each of these things. First though, let's, let's talk about modems. Um, and if you've ever had to work directly with a cellular or Wi-Fi modem, you might be familiar with AT commands or the Hayes command set. Uh, and this is a style of interaction that's been around since the early modems of 1981, and it's actually still in use today for many embedded modules. And for many developers, myself included, AT commands are cryptic and inaccessible, inaccessible right? It feels like an incantation to get an AT command that can actually do something that you expect it to do. They're non-intuitive, and they can differ from one module to the next, even though the underlying command set is supposed to be relatively standard and the same. It's a very painful way to add connectivity to your application. So to combat the difficulty of programming radios, many IoT vendors put up guardrails that's, that are designed to help us as developers. Many create narrow guardrails and abstract away the complexity into developer-friendly APIs. And the problem here is that they also force you to adopt their host microcontroller, their RTOS, or even a particular programming language. And as nice as it is to abstract away AT commands, it's often off-putting to developers to take away that much choice in exchange. 
But on the other side of the spectrum, other providers give you very wide guardrails, right? All they sell you is a SIM or a piece of hardware that you have to furnish your own SIM and plan for. And the approach here has certainly brought down the cost of IoT or M2M data plans, but it swings way too far in the other direction. You get cheap-ish connectivity, but as a developer, you're left to build up the rest of the solution stack yourself. You end up with the equivalent of writer's block or blank page syndrome because there's just so much you have to choose to build out the rest of your solution. So frankly, what happens is in both cases, you're either left with too much of a green field or too little. The third challenge is, is one that I refer to as the pitfalls of device lifecycle management. And the reality here is that most IoT products don't really follow a happy path where they spend no time on a shelf, they're deployed to the field immediately, and they're used forever and ever without end. Instead, all IoT devices pretty much go through a consistent life cycle. They go through a manufacturing or inventory or distribution stage where they sit idle. They go through an activation stage where they're first used, a period where they fall into disuse, but the device is still online and accruing, freeze, uh, accruing fees, like for instance, a, a Kindle that you only use while you're on vacation. They go through a period of temporary breakage. It can often take months before the issue is identified and fixed. The recommissioning after fixing and then a period where the device may be decommissioned permanently and the challenge here in the iot space is that each of these phases in the device life cycle in the device life cycle introduces carrier fees and transaction costs that can be really difficult to plan and budget for and what it means for us as developers is that when we look at an iot device we aren't really sure what its actual true cost is. We see the cost on the tin, we see the cost of potentially a data plan, but we don't really know what it's gonna cost us over the period of the solution that we're attempting to build with it. Next is security. And this is something that's often not considered during prototyping uh, by many of us as developers in which a lot of pro providers don't even bake into their products. But key and certificate management is an essential part of every IoT solution. The reason why we're putting the internet into our things is because we need to actually put that data somewhere and do something with it. And all IoT platforms pretty much now require TLS communication. And so in the absence of more secure approaches, what ends up happening is the developers are forced to store keys and firmware in order to work with cloud services. And for devices themselves, the provisioning process is also very painful and developers are often left to, left to muddle through when it comes to getting ready to do something in the last minute before deploying your pilot. Uh, what it comes down to is that a lot of security isn't really baked in from the start for a product. And then finally, there's the string of the prototype and production disconnect. And in one sense, we should consider ourselves really fortunate that prototyping is accessible as it is today, thanks to companies like Arduino and Adafruit, SparkFun, and the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I'm very, very happy that we live in the world where the, a world where those companies exist and provide the products that they do. But most of the devices produced by these companies have been so focused on the maker market that a lot of us developers don't take them seriously for production use, in spite of the fact that many are built with that in mind. IoT engineers will gladly use these accessible tools to prove an idea at the prototype stage, but are often forced to throw these away in, in, when it's time to start over and build a quote unquote real solution. And so with all that complexity in mind, there's also the challenge of IoT connectivity itself. And at this point, I wanna hand it over to Rob to talk a bit of some of what that space looks like. Yeah, so as I mentioned previously, I really just joined Blues Wireless a couple months ago. And one thing I learned right away that I'm sure many of you have already learned is that when it comes to IoT network connectivity, there's a ton of options available to us. And a lot of them are legi legitimately good options, right? And kind of related to this, part of what I think makes Blues great is that we are a company of developers building products for developers. And so this means our products and our messaging like today, they have to be valuable and authentic. So. To that end, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes uncovering what I see kind of as this, you know, mystery of IoT connectivity. You know, what options are out there and what are the pros and cons of each? And the first, um, actually, again, while there are a lot of legitimately good options, we are kind of all of a sudden presented with this paradox of choice, right? This idea that when we have too many choices, it can be almost paralyzing for us. So. Each of us with our own IoT solutions have to identify what's most important, even on a project by project basis. So is it communication range? You know, how close to a provider's gateway 
do does my device have to be? Are there location specific uh, considerations, indoor versus outdoor line of sight? Um, anything else I need to be aware of? Power efficiency is the next. Is my hardware connected to a reliable power source or is it off grid? Maybe it's run off of solar and battery. Um, if it is like, how long does my device have to last on that battery power? And what about availability? Is it okay if my device shuts down completely in the event of a local power failure? Or if it's monitoring a critical system, should it continue to record, maybe even send data while it's on a backup power source? Then we have an issue of you know, data throughput and latency. So how much data are you pushing, pulling, how frequently does the solution that you're creating require absolute low latency between the device to the cloud and beyond? Or is it okay if the data arrives to the cloud at maybe hourly or even daily or weekly intervals? And then the final one is end user experience. So how is your solution deployed in the field? Is it okay if somebody, uh, you know, if the solution requires uh, an installer or somebody familiar with network configuration to set it up? Or does the device itself need to just work um, you know, by a non-technical user when it powers on? So when we look at some of these options more closely, you know, wired ethernet, it's, it's the beloved backbone of our internet. It's all of our dream in terms of bandwidth, speed, and reliability. Um, we, you know, we've all probably seen adding an RJ45 connector on an ethernet module does add considerable bulk. Um, but there are pros and cons here. So if you're in an indoor deployment and, and wired ethernet is readily available, it's great. High bandwidth, low latency, obviously, is really key, uh, a key advantage of wired ethernet. The downside, again, those physical environment issues, are you having to run CAT 5E or CAT 6 cabling? Um, power consumption relative to some of the other solutions, uh, these ethernet modules, I'm being I'm generalizing here, but a lot of them do consume more power than others. And obviously mobility. If you have a solution that needs to move, wired ethernet is not gonna solve the problem for you. And the next being Wi-Fi. Um, you know, today's Wi-Fi routers have come a long way in terms of speed, reliability, and um, via some new protocols, power consumption as well. So modern routers commonly support at least one of the latest wireless standards. If you haven't read about it yet, the new 802.11ah standard is pretty intriguing with its low power consumption. Um, it also has this ability for connected devices to share signals amongst themselves, making it a potential uh, Bluetooth killer. The downside with uh, 802.11h though is AH is that it's still likely years away from mainstream routers seeing this as a standard. So in terms of those pros and cons, again, if you have Wi-Fi coverage, great. Like Ethernet, generally you get pretty high bandwidth and low latency. Uh, end user setup for non-technical users can be tedious, especially when router passwords change. Uh, if you are deploying in a public unmanaged network, obviously security is a, is a major issue there. Power consumption, for Wi-Fi modules can vary uh, based on the uh, protocols you're using and based on um, how much data you're push pushing and pulling over Wi-Fi. Um, then we get to cellular. And so when I say cellular, I'm, I'm really focusing on uh, the cellular IoT standards like LTEM and NB-IoT. Uh, if you're not familiar with these protocols at a high level, LTEM is the faster of the two, and it's also compatible with this existing LTE infrastructure making it pretty popular. NB-IoT uh, does have a wider theoretical range, but it does require upgrades to hardware at the cell tower. Unlike LTEM though, it does not support devices that are in motion. So there's no tower handoff, meaning you have to reestablish new connections. Um, and it does require devices to be pre-configured with a proper frequency band. So pros and cons here, obviously cellular global coverage. You can get at least 2G access almost everywhere in the world. Uh, data security. So if data security is critical to your solution, you know, when you work with cellular providers and custom APNs properly, the data itself doesn't even need to traverse across the internet, it can go directly from the carrier to your cloud provider. Um, and again, when done properly, uh, cellular modules can consume very little power. And I put no power on here as well, because uh, say you're in a scenario, like I mentioned earlier, Wi-Fi cuts out. Um, any local networking cuts out, your cellular is still going to run. So if you're running a system, you know, if it's fire monitoring, smoke detection, 
carbon monoxide, all those environmental concerns or even security scenarios, uh, cellular can have a, have a huge advantage there. On the downside for cellular, of course, it's not good for high band with low latency, especially with IoT solutions. And um, if you're trying to do any voice over LTE, like any audio, speech, any low latency requirements there, um, cellular is not a great idea. And finally, I'm kind of lumping in, this is, I, I totally admit this is not fair, but in the interest of time, I'm lumping all this other like LP WAN tech in here. So that's low power wide area network um, technologies. So this, the most popular by far, I think, is LoRa and LoRaWAN, but at a high level, this can really include some of their competitors like Sigfox or Ingenu. So LoRa stands for Long Range Radio, and it's an open standard networking layer, definitely gaining popularity in the EU. Um, it is supported by the LoRa Alliance, and it aims to solve this traditional IoT dilemma we have of balancing low power requirements with long range communication. So LoRa, if you get confused with LoRa versus LoRaWAN, LoRa is like the physical layer and LoRaWAN is actually the networking layer. So in ideal conditions, LoRa devices can communicate with LoRaWAN gateways from like five kilometers to 15 kilometers away. In practice, physical obstacles like, you know, trees and buildings can disrupt data transmission and get in the way. Um, LoRa also does require an adequate network of physical gateways to be effective. So, there are some cities such as Amsterdam, I believe, that are investing pretty heavily in LoRaWAN, making it a pretty intriguing option in some urban settings. In terms of the pros and cons quick, you know, LoRa was invented, data security is a primary concern. If you are deploying outdoors in the EU, it can be a very uh, worthwhile technology to look into. And also along with that data security, uh, all LoRa devices are considered low power. The downsides of course, global availability, you're relying on these physical LoRaWAN gateways to be deployed, and it's not ideal for high, band high bandwidth scenarios either. So if, you know, what's right for you? Well, it's really going to depend on your requirements, right? In terms of high level pros and cons, I think this is fairly accurate, uh, you know, from my perspective at least. And as a bit of a seg here, what we're trying to do at Blues Wireless is turn this little red dot uh, into green here for uh, cellular in terms of cost, developer experience, uh, and deployment as well. Awesome. Thanks, Rob. So hopefully you all are, you know, as you've heard all of these strings of, of cellular IoT, as you have, have, as Rob has talked through some of these various communications options, you know, the, the word that tends to stand out for me when I think about all of these different things is complexity, right? Uh, it, it creates this environment for us where complexity rules when we're setting out to build a solution. From the jump, the path of selecting a board to building a prototype to deploying and scaling a pilot fill is filled with hurdles and roadblocks that make it hard for many initiatives to succeed. And when I think about that word complexity, uh, not coincidentally, I think about a quote from our founder, Ray Ozzie, and it's something that he actually said long before setting out to start this company. Uh, during his time at Microsoft, but which it, it applies very much to the IoT of the present. And that, that quote is, complexity kills. Uh, it's, I'm guessing that it's one that many of you have heard before, even if you aren't sure who it was attributed to directly. But it should come as no surprise, given that, that Ray was motivated to start Blue's Wireless after experiencing some of the pain of building an IoT solution firsthand. And I'll give you a little bit of that story here. Uh, Ray is actually on the board of an environmental data nonprofit called SafeCast. And SafeCast was formed in the wake of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant meltdown of 2011. That actually just had its 10 year anniversary uh, earlier this month. And the, the founders wanted to create a way to collect and share radiation data from the exclusion zone. And the effort has since expanded to be one of the largest citizen science projects in the world. And their goal is to cover every road and location worldwide and to really to, to visit, you know, to be able to monitor dangerous and just everyday locations across the world. And as a part of his involvement with SafeCast, Ray set out to build an IoT device that could, could collect both radiation and general air quality data from remote and inaccessible, in, inaccessible locations and operate for a year or more on a single battery. So think about that, a low power cellular power device running for a year or more on a battery. And you can imagine that along the way, 
he experienced many of the strings and challenges that we have talked about above, that we've talked about in the last few minutes. So Ray decided to set, he, he set out to solve these problems, not just for himself and for SafeCast, but for IoT developers everywhere. And over the last two plus years, he and our small team have been working to create a set of products that give developers everywhere the ability to easily build IoT solutions with no strings attached. And those products are low power prepaid cellular IoT modules, a set of developer ready carrier boards for prototyping and for production, and then finally a secure device console for managing devices, data and integrations with other cloud applications. And so for the rest of our time today, we're going to talk about each of these three and give you a couple of demos of, of what these look like. But first, let's talk about the note card. The note card is the center of our universe. It's a device to cloud data pump. It's ready to embed into new and existing applications. There's a lot packed into this tiny little thing. It includes a cellular and GPS GNSS module from Quicktel, an embedded SIM, an onboard Cortex M4 MCU, a secure element with pre-provisioned keys, an onboard accelerometer, a temp sensor, and an M.2 edge connector for deploying in your own projects. And as a developer myself who's worked with a number of IoT solutions, what I find most compelling about the note card is its cost, the fact that it's a low power cellular device, and its API. First cost, uh, you'll recall from earlier that one of the strings of, si of wireless IoT is the shadow cost, this idea of you're not really, you don't really know what you're getting or what the cost of the product is going to be. Uh, but with it, you know, you pay for a device and then you pay for its data. But with the note card, 10 years and 500 megs of data are included with the cost of the device and the devices start at $49. That's it. It's the cost that's on the tin. You'll never get a monthly bill for SIM usage. One way to look at this is that the note card is kind of like the Kindle for cellular IoT. Your data plan is included in the cost of the device. And we have narrow band and wide band versions of the note card with AT&T back support in over 135 countries. And depending on which note card you choose, we support narrow band IoT, LTEM, CATM, and CAT1 networks. Compared to other solutions out there, if you add in the cost of the hardware plus the device or plus the data plan, the note card is about 10 times less expensive for 10 years of cellular access, which is a really powerful way. It's, it's, the, it's the kind of price that allows you to start prototyping even with cellular without worrying that you're starting a clock immediately on a monthly plan. It's also a low power by default device. The device was designed to operate in battery and solar environments, and it draws as little as eight microamps when idle. That's actually less than the internal self drain of most batteries. So for example, a standard 2000 milliamp pouch LiPo battery has a self drain of about 75 microamps continuously. So the note card is not gonna be the thing that drags down the power in your solution. It's also a secure device. Keys and certificates are actually burned to the onboard ST Safe module at the factory. And all communications between the note card and our cloud service occur off the internet via, via our, our partnership with AT&T and their cell network and our own managed VPN. And this is really powerful. There is no key provisioning. There is no handshake process that has to happen in order to obtain keys from a cloud service. They're on the device, they're baked in at the point of manufacture. And finally, the note, card, the note card module itself is PTCRB in product certified. So you can include it in your own product without having to recertify the radio. And finally, and this is one of my favorite features, the note card speaks 100% JSON. It takes JSON requests and returns JSON responses. There are no AT commands required to turn on the radio, perform a sync, connect to GPS or anything. Everything that you can do with a note card is wrapped up in a JSON based API that is simple and flexible. And it's also documented extensively at our developer portal at dev.blues.io, along with complete guides, tutorials, and samples. Now, before I get to the demo, I wanted to briefly introduce a, a few concepts of, uh, that are key to how the note card works. Typically, a developer will interact with a note card from a host microcontroller or single board computer over a serial or I2C connection. Now, often that host will include sensors and actual actuators that need to be monitored or controlled remotely. To send sensor data to the note card, the host creates something called a note, which is just a JSON object with key value pairs like temp or humidity in this example. Notes are created on the note card with, with what's called a, with an API request called a note.add request. And this places the note in something called a note file, which is just a collection of arbitrary JSON notes that you create. And then when the note card is ready to sync, it sends that note file to our cloud service called the note hub, 
which we'll talk more about in a little bit. And from here, your sensor data can be monitored and sent along to third-party cloud services and to your own cloud applications. But it's also possible to actually send notes back to the note card and ultimately to your host through the note hub. Much as with the note card, this starts by adding another note, an inbound note to a note file. And then, then that, that actually gets sent from note hub down to the note card itself. And this is a point at which your host can actually retrieve that and take action. So the note card is also a bi-directional data pump. You can communicate to the cloud and to your applications and from the cloud into your hosts, into the note card as well. So enough talking, let's actually take a little bit, let's, let's take a look at a demo. And I am going to switch over. I'm actually going to share, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment because I'm gonna share my video uh, on my desktop so that you all, you all can actually see the product in action. And if you wanna to switch to just speaker view, if you're not already, you can actually see what's happening on my desktop here, but I wanted to actually show off a couple of our products and Rob will talk about a few more in a moment, but this is the note card itself. And hopefully autofocus is working. It's about a, you know, 30 by 34, 32 by 34 millimeter device, not very large. It has the cellular modem on the back and all the other goodies on the front. And this is the product. This is the module that you can embed in whatever end product that you're actually working on with a standard M.2 edge connector. Uh, but for most of us, when we're actually prototyping, we're working on our applications or potentially even building a solution, you'll use something called a note carrier, which we'll, we'll discuss in a bit more detail. But the advantage of the note carrier is that I can immediately just plug the device in and I'm off to being able to actually start doing something with it. So I'm, I, right now what I've done is I plug this note card and note carrier into my, uh, into my computer over USB. And I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. And I'm going to show you how you can actually start using it right away. So the first thing that you'll do when you actually get a note card and note carrier is head over to dev.blues.io. The first place that we direct developers is to our quick start. And what happens in our quick start is our quick start is the sort of getting started first five minutes experience with a note card. This will actually give you an opportunity to, to pick whichever note carrier you're working with walks you through how to actually connect the thing based on what you get uh, in the box from us. Uh, and then the fun part is actually then starting to communicate with the device from within the browser. So I can actually using our, uh, our web-based uh, REPL environment, connect directly to the note card over USB and then start issuing commands to it. So as I go through this quick start, I can actually in interrogate the device and see what's happening, but you'll see Again, 100% JSON in, JSON out. So if I want to actually find out from the note card, what version of firmware are you running? When was it built? What's your device ID? I can issue a request called card.version, right? And as I go through this process, this tutorial will actually walk me through giving my device a, uh, giving my product a name. So I can actually send another request called hub.get that will actually tell me how my device is configured. It tells me what my product UID is. This is what associates my note card to our secure cloud service. It tells me how often my device is configured to sync notes inbound and outbound, et cetera. Again, all using JSON. I send a JSON command in, I get a JSON response out. And as you go through this process, this will actually walk you through syncing to the note hub. So you can actually initiate a command manually to sync the device to the cloud service and then check the status of that really everything that you can do that you would see yourself doing through a host mcu you can you can start to experiment experiment with here uh, in the web repl environment and the most important part the reason why we get these devices is because we want to actually measure something and do something with it and so the way that you'll do that most of the time as i mentioned earlier is what's called a note add request and you'll pass just an arbitrary json body along that can be whatever you want. In the example here, what I'm saying is I want to send a fake temperature and humidity values to the note card with a note.add. I get a response telling me the number of notes that are queued and ready to go. If I send this multiple times, you'll see that the, uh, the, the, the value actually increases as those notes are queued to sync uh, and end up in the right place. Now, if I again run another hub.sync, what will happen is the device will actually connect to NoHub and start sending that into the cloud service. And this is a piece that Rob will talk about uh, in a few minutes. 
But just to give you a bit of a sneak peek, when those events show up, they show up again as JSON objects. And these JSON objects in our cloud service can then be routed out into whatever cloud service you prefer, wherever your ultimate cloud application lives. Uh, so our dev site is the place to go to learn more about this. This is dev.blues.io. And if you have a device, the quick start's the great place to start. But once you actually get past that, our API, we have a complete API reference that walks through all of the different requests that you can send and provides examples for what happens when you actually send this, or this request and you know, what you can expect to get on the other side. So I'm actually gonna turn it over, stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna turn it over to Rob so that he can start sharing his and talk about note carriers. Yeah, thank you, Brandon. Let me get my screens sorted out here. Um, let's see. All right. So many windows. <laughs> and where's my keynote? Let's see. Is that sharing? Not yet. Curious. Um, uh, you might need to. You want me to go ahead and keep going? Yeah, I mean, I'm getting a. It's saying unknown for all of my windows in Zoom, so I'm wondering if. Oh gosh. Okay. Here, I'll just. Oh, I'll just share for a little bit longer. Um, yeah. Let's see if I can figure it out. All right, go for it. Anyway, yeah. Aside from Brandon uh, stealing a lot of my thunder, there, I'll see what I can do to, to wow you all. Um, but yeah, as Brandon was talking about the note card, you know, it is an awesome little module here that's easy to use and ready for any product. Um, many developers, of course, you know, you're not looking to spin a board from scratch with an M2 connector for a prototype. So in addition to these note cards, we also have a number of carrier boards, which are called note carriers. And these all help you get started using the note card. So there are three types of note carriers that I want to briefly discuss today. First is the note carrier AF. And it's meant to be used with one of the 50 or more Adafruit Feather MCUs on the market. So the AF includes a Feather socket, three I square seat ports for plugging in external peripherals. It's got LiPo and solar JST connectors, and it has onboard cellular and GPS antennas. And finally, like all the other boards, it has a micro USB port for power and USB serial access to the note card. Then we have the note carrier Pi, and the Pi is uh, the Pi hat is perfect for adding a note card to a single board computer. It includes a Grove I square C port for external peripherals, of course, a Raspberry Pi compatible and stackable 40 pin header, and again, a micro USB port for that serial access to the note card. And the note carrier A series. Now, there's three variants to the A. All have this onboard cellular and GPS antenna, of course, as well as that micro USB port. Beyond that, there's some slight variance between the three. The AL provides LiPo and solar JST connectors for building a fully solar powered solution. The AA provides a three AA battery pack on the back for traditional battery powered applications. And then the AE is a kind of a bare board with castellated edges uh, that can be soldered directly onto a custom PCB if you wanna incorporate the note card and note carrier directly into an end product. So regardless of the note, carrier and note card and note carrier you choose, another really powerful feature of the note card, and I can't emphasize this enough, is that it works with any MCU or SBC and with any language. So you can talk to the note card from you know, high-end SBCs all the way down to 8-bit MCUs like an Arduino Uno. The note card works with any language that can simply output and read strings. You know, we provide libraries and samples for Arduino, C, C++, and Python. And we also provide a variety of samples for uh, development boards, SBCs, and MCUs. So right now, hopefully, I can get my Zoom uh, screen sharing to work here. But I wanted to, uh, you know, show off a quick demo of using an ESP32 in a note carrier AF. Let me see how my screen sharing works now. Um, let's try this one. Oh no. Okay, Zoom's asking for uh, 
Here, here's something you should do before you start a webinar, and that's make sure your system preferences are set up properly to share a screen. <laughs> do you want me to, I can, while you're doing that, I can do the Python one first. If you want to, because I have to quit and reopen yeah. Zoom. Yeah, good hey, job, Rob. I mean, all right, never, I'll be right back. Demos never work the way they're supposed to, so that's that is all right. I'll uh, I'll start. Okay, so what we, you. Want do, what we want to do in this demo is basically show y'all how this multi language concept really works. Um, and I just got a beach ball on my Zoom. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. So I have gone back to sharing again. Um, this idea of being able to be, you know, any MCU, any language that you prefer is really powerful because you're not locked into using a variant of RRTOS or C or something along those lines. Whatever host you prefer is the thing you want to work with. And this also works just across your own applications. We have a lot of customers that are building prototypes with the Arduino or STM32 ecosystem, but they're also simultaneously looking at doing something with a Raspberry Pi or a Jetson Nano or, you know, a, another similar Pi compatible single board computer device. And so what I wanted to demo was actually a, uh, was the, the Python side of this first, specifically with CircuitPython. So I'm actually going to go back to sharing my other webcam to show you something else that's on my desk. I have on my uh, desk another one of our devices. This is the Note Carrier AF. Um, we have a version of this that's available in our, in our store that comes with an ESP32. So you can start doing Arduino based applications very easily. I actually pulled out my ESP32 and I put a different device in here. It's an Adafruit Feather M4. Uh, the Feather M4 is a completely different microcontroller. It runs in a SAMD51. Uh, it runs Arduino, but it also runs CircuitPython. So I have CircuitPython loaded on this device and a Grove BME680 temperature and humidity sensor that's on here. So I'm going to plug this in and actually show you how I can really, how easy it is to use the note card with a circuit Python based application, just as I would with a Arduino based application. So let me go back to my desktop and I am going to share a, you can open, uh, you know, typically you would use VS code for Python based applications, but I'm using Mu because it's got a nice serial monitor. Um, but everything that I showed you before in the in our web REPL was just sending raw JSON commands. Most of the time when you're experimenting, that'll be something that you'll use. When you're actually coming, when it comes to actually building your end application, you're working with a host, it's going to be however your preferred language or your microcontroller works with JSON-based strings. And so in my application, and Rob's going to show you an Arduino-based version of this that looks very similar in a moment, but, in the, but is in C. Uh, it is literally just I'm creating JSON strings in Python and then sending those to the device. I actually am, am using, we have a Python library that works on the Raspberry Pi or desktop Python. It works with CircuitPython and MicroPython. It's called NotePython that is in our GitHub organization. And you can read about it on our dev site as well. Uh, but I'm importing that library, making an I2C connection to the note card and then sending requests. And you'll see I'm configuring the device to speak to my, my project here, my Riot Lunch and Learn project. And then every 15 seconds, I'm reading temperature and humidity readings from my BME 680 and then sending those a node add request. And if I open up the serial monitor, uh, you can actually see these requests come across. I'm reading it's you know 24.6 degrees Celsius in my office right now, 29% humidity. And then I'm actually adding each of those to the note card. I'm adding each of those readings every 15 seconds to the note card. If I save this, you'll actually see the program restart. You can see, um, and of course, now is when the demo doesn't work. Oh, yeah, there we go. So you can see the reload uh, as I go through. I can, you can see, first of all, the configuration command that I'm sending in my hub.set request at the beginning. Uh, and so that is on the microcontroller side. And on the cloud side, if I load this, I can actually show you those events as they're popping in from that device. So these are the actual readings that are coming in uh, from my device using CircuitPython. Now, Rob, I presume you are ready to share. Maybe the sharing will work this time. You are accurate, yes. Y'all don't know how embarrassing it is to, to screw up something so fundamental, but ah, you can, all right. I will uh, share my screen here. So Brandon already showed you a lot of this. Um, here we go. Uh, but just so basically solving the same problem, but in, in Arduino IDE. So I'm using a, uh, let me hold up the, to my camera here, plug it in. 
So I've got the um, Feather Huzzah 32 here. Whoops. That's my record controller. I've got my note card embedded on a note carrier AF. And then I just have a little BME 280 uh, hooked up as well. So to walk through the, the code here really quickly, uh, you know, it's it's really it's really pleasing to me, I think, to see how easy it is to get up and running with the note card and with a you know a simple sensor example. So I'm including a variety of uh, or including the note card note Arduino library and um, the the Adafruit. Uh, BME 280 sensor libraries as well. Uh, we are again associating the um, the product UID from NoteHub. So this is the way to associate my note card with the cloud-based project. You know, adding references to the note card and the BME sensor. In my setup method, we're initializing the sensor and the note card. And this is where it gets really cool for me from a programmer standpoint is I'm starting to create these JSON-based requests. So I'm issuing hub.set, which again, allows me to associate that product UID with this note card. I'm also setting my device in continuous mode. And what this means is maintain a continuous cellular connection. Now, this is great for webinars and demos, of course, because instantly, basically, my device data can appear on the cloud. But in battery powered scenarios where power is more of a consideration, there's a periodic mode where you can actually set how often you want the device to connect to save on, uh, on battery power. Finally, in my, my loop here, I'm simply gonna be printing out some values to the serial terminal so we can all see what that looks like. And again, more importantly, we need to send this, this data that I'm accumulating, accumulating on my device to the cloud. And we do that with a note.add request. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna say, add an event, which we also, we also call a note to a specific note file so we can uniquely identify it. And I'm calling that sensors.qo. I'm submitting the sync equals true parameter, which tells the note card to immediately sync this with the cloud. Again, very useful for me right now, but maybe not might be ideal for you in a battery powered scenario. And then in the body, of my JSON object, I'm gonna add two variables, a temperature variable and a humidity variable. So all really, really straightforward. And then we're gonna do this every 10 seconds. So with that in play, let me get this running on my device. And while that is working, let me share my other screen, my terminal window rather. Do right here. So what's cool about seeing this in the terminal like Brandon showed you is I can actually see the raw JSON objects that are being sent. So we have our note.add with the temperature and humidity values and we have a return. This is the return or the response I should say from NoteHub which is saying that yes, one note was sent to the cloud and we can see our data coming through there. I can hold my finger on the sensor to try and uh, jack up the temperature a little bit here for the next the next note, let's see if I can get it above 22. I would hope so. Maybe I'm dead. Come on, baby. No, oh, it's giving me the same one, that's strange. Um, I had a bit of a bum sensor this morning. It was returning null values, so that could be related to my, um, my current problems. Anyway, the data is being uh, sent over to NoteHub and, and we'll show that all uh, in a bit. And in the meantime, awesome. Yeah, if you want to take yeah. the slides from here, Rob. Yeah. So, it, actually, speaking of that, I do want to introduce you all to NoteHub itself. Get my my Windows reset here once again. All right. Cool. So, you know, obviously, like the the IoT sensors, the solutions that we're putting together, you know, they, they're comprised of sensor, sensors and other hardware, but rarely does the story really end there for any of us, right? There's little point in adding this connectivity to a product if we're not going to leverage that in some way to gain insight or control the product or something. So in the Blue's wireless ecosystem, NoteHub is this secure conduit for this device to cloud connectivity through the note card. So NoteHub Again, it is a secure device console. It gives you the tools to manage 
anything from a single device, a single note card, through to any number of devices or even fleets of devices. These devices are all auto-provisioned with a secure VPN tunnel. Um, once you add that valid product UID, which you saw in the demos. So it, Note, Cub, Note Hub does enable, as Brandon mentioned, this bi-directional communication as well with the note card. Uh, it can also propagate device, fleet, and project settings even through environment variables, which I'll show you briefly in a sec. And through this device console, we can monitor um, device events, uh, sessions, as well as onboard temperature and voltage settings on the note card itself. And finally, NoteHub does provide this facility for performing OTA firmware updates as well. So you can update the note card firmware as well as connected host MCU firmware all through the note card API. And NoteHub does allow you to route your project data to any cloud application. So we provide built-in routes for major cloud providers as well as support for uh, routing to generic HTTP or MQTT endpoints. And to ensure that you're only transferring the data that your cloud, um, the data you need in your cloud apps, we also provide a series of built-in data transformations and support for JSONata, which is the sophisticated transformation language for JSON data. Now, in the last demo, I do want to show off the process of creating routes to third-party services. So we're going to leverage the data that I already created. And let me bring up a browser window here that I can share. Here we go. Holy smokes. Um, I may have hit the wrong button here. Stop the share. I don't think I've ever had this kind of a screen sharing issues with. How about this one? There we it's go. Good it's good now. <laughs> um, so what you're viewing now is NoteHub. Now NoteHub by default, it's very project centric. Each one of these is an individual project I've created like a sample project um, over my last couple months here. Each project can hold N number of devices or even fleets of devices. So it's the highest level of organization. Um, I do wanna show off just a few key features in NoteHub. I'm not gonna go into everything in detail. Each, as, as I mentioned, each project can hold a certain number of devices. So these are the devices that are associated with my webinar project. This is the one, in fact, that we just saw that I just used uh, a couple minutes ago. And we can, in the devices window here, as I mentioned, you can do note card firmware updates all through the cloud interface, the host MCU updates. You can view your data usage if you're curious about that as well, all through the device um, menu. Also, I'm going to skip down here for a sec because I wanted to show off two of the settings that I think are pretty key. We do allow you to provision access to your project to other users so that we have this role-based provisioning ability within NodeHub. And also, there's also this ability to specify environment variables. We touched on this briefly, but these variables, they're all key value pairs, and they can be anything from device-specific to fleet specific to project specific variables. So imagine you wanna assign, assign something like any kind of key value pair uh, to an individual device to uniquely identify it in some way all the way up through a project. I mean, there's like limitless things you can do with this. I think it's a pretty incredibly useful uh, developer feature. But as Brandon showed earlier, what's key to us, oh, this is all my bad data. So here's an example of bad data from my BME 280 sensor. Um, so this is a, 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 an ongoing list of all of the events, the notes that were sent from my device to the cloud. And as Brandon showed you, you can, let me find actually a legitimate one here. We can go ahead and view the details of this note. So we got product UID information, unique device identifiers, dates. There's actually cell tower locations in here as well. There's a lot of metadata that can be attached to these notes. In the body itself, this is what you saw me uh, create in the Arduino IDE. So I was sending the humidity and the temperature data. You can view the full JSON object that was sent along. And now this is when it gets interesting because again, like the data that we're putting in NoteHub, generally that's not where the story ends. 
But if I'm going to extend that story, I'm going to say that odds are I don't want to send all of this data to my third-party cloud provider. Um, so I'm going to want to not only route that this data somewhere else, but I want to kind of consolidate this to make it either massage it or just limit what I'm actually sending. So this is where the routes feature from NodeHub comes into play. And what I've done is I, I've already created a route to UbiDots. And if you're not familiar with UbiDots, it's a really fun IoT data visualization platform. And what I've done is created a, a route to UbiDots. And in UbiDots case, it's just a, a general HTTP, HTTPS endpoint. So it's a RESTful API endpoint. To, to create this, this route, I had to simply supply an um, auth token. And you can all see my auth token here. I guess I need to probably not present that in a webinar. Uh, but it's, uh, I'm also specifying a route URL. So again, this is just that RESTful API endpoint. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes I'm gonna wanna uh, trans or, uh, uh, alter my data on the fly and I can use a JSON auto expression to do so. So in my case right here, I'm creating a new JSON object that has a value as the key and, or yeah, value, which is the text, which is the key. Uh, and I'm sending the body dot temperature. So the temperature from the body object and also adding a timestamp to it. So every time I submit data up to NodeHub, it's gonna grab that data and translate it and send it over to UbiDots. Now, if I pop over to my UbiDots dashboard, I can actually look at the data that's been coming in. And if I navigate into my temperature variable, I can see all of the data that's been delivered to UbiDots from NodeHub. And if this doesn't show up in a second, I'll skip over it. Oh, here we go. So here's all the data that I've been pumping into UbiDots over time. Now this fundamentally, of course, isn't really that much different from what I was seeing in NodeHub. However, cool part about UbiDots is all about the data visualization aspect of it. So if I head back over to my dashboard, I can go ahead and add a couple of widgets here really quickly. So let me throw in a histogram here and I will add this temperature data. Just use the defaults here for, for uh, uh, ease of uh, display. So I've got my, uh, my temperature data visualized in a histogram. Since I'm actually displaying temperature data, why not throw a thermometer in here as well? So let's grab that same data but maybe show the max temperature I was ever able to uh, create today. And sure enough, there it is. So, I mean, very simplistic example, but it does show the power of how we're able to go from, you know, this device on my desktop here to the cloud in a matter of seconds or minutes. Now, um, to wind things down here, you head back over to Keynote. Jeepers, where's my keynote? So my keynote, uh, Brandon, can you share your screen again? My, I seem to have lost my yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fine. slide deck. I'll go through it again. Wait, hold on. Yep, one second. I just got mine back if you're unable. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go for it. Cool. Awesome. So thanks everyone. So um, basically, yeah, I just we just wanted to end by thanking everyone. Um, if you're interested in learning more about NoCard, head over to blues.io. We wanted to, you know, offer you all a discount code, which we'll copy and paste in the chat window as well. So it's 10% off. A note card using that code. We uh, do have a blog post that's based on some of the similar content that was presented today. So that's at Blues.io blog. You can find it there. And also feel free to reach out to us individually. Our email addresses are right here. If you have any questions or concerns once you get started, uh, you know we're definitely super willing to work with you all one-on-one -on -one to, to make, make you successful with the note card and note carrier. And with that, I think we can transition to a Q&A if there's questions that have been sent in.
Yeah, we can. I have uh, I have one that I was going to pull up. Oh, thanks, Caroline, for sharing our email addresses. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, there was one question. There's a few that I've been answering in chat. Um, thank you for for posting those and for the questions about Edge Impulse and uh, Edge ML and cellular IoT, which we are keenly interested in and keep an eye out for some projects from the Blues team related to that in the next couple of months. So there was a question from, let me go back from Mark Nichols about have we looked at CBRS versus traditional 4G, 5G? And for those of you that may not have heard of that, CBRS is Citizens Broadband Radio Service, which is a part of the shared innovation. It is a shared spectrum technology on the 3.5 band. Um, I can be honest, I'll be honest with you, Mark, we, we have not looked at it directly, but we are always sort of paying attention to what other, you know, what communications technologies are out there. And um, I don't have anything, we don't have anything in our products now that supports it directly, but it is something that we'll continue to monitor and see if it, if it makes sense for us to support CVRS in our products. Any other, any other questions? And I guess with the, we have five minutes left. So if anybody even wants to just unmute and ask the question, we're happy to hear from you. If not, you can throw it in chat. Yeah, hi, this is Bill. Can you hear hey, me? Bill. Yeah. Um, I was just interested in learning a little bit more about the physical layer communication between this M.2 note card and the embedded host. Oh, for sure. So yeah, I may have glossed over it earlier, uh, Bill, but you have a couple of different options. We support either both I squared C and serial, uh, TXRX serial. So two wire approaches in both cases. It's really, really easy uh, to communicate between the two. Those are the approaches. Does that answer the question or do you want me to go a little bit further? Um, yeah, that, that answers the basic question. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the, the and a second follow-up question, I'm sorry, I missed the first 10 minutes or so of this, of this but I, no um, but let me uh, ask anyway. Um, in, in terms of the, um, the data that you're passing in terms of uh, these notes with uh, JSON strings and stuff, what are what are the limitations on like how much data could be passed over something like that? Um, in other words, could you like embed a, a JPEG picture and send send that over a note? That's a fantastic question, Bill. Thank you for that. Um, the limitations are you you can actually send. Images. I will give you the caveat to say that the no card is not meant to be used for streaming media for high bandwidth, low latency style applications. But with that said, if you're doing something like person detection with low res images, if you're doing something like IR work and you need to be able to stream, uh, you know, collections of bytes over, you know, a, a certain size, you absolutely can do that with a no card and you have a couple of different options. Um, I didn't call this out specifically, but you can, in addition to sending a JSON object in a node add request, you can send a base64 payload as well. So it is actually possible to take a JPEG or other sort of uh, binary resource and the base64 that into one or a series of strings and then send those to the note card that way. So we have a couple of customers that are doing that in that form. One customer in particular that is actually creating, they're actually creating uh office documents right word documents that they're base 64 ing and sending uh through the note card for certain types of uh, certain types of scenarios so you absolutely can do that and your limits are um you know obviously you need to be sort of cognizant of your data plane with that but we've seen customers that can send anywhere between 4 to 15k size binary payloads up uh with the note card on an individual request great Thanks thank you part. Yeah, sure. I have another question if nobody else has. Uh... Yeah, go for it. Um, in, in passing these notes, um, I assume, you know, that there's, there's some quality of service kind of features, like I'm sure the notes are error corrected and, um, guaranteed delivery. Um, are there any other kind of quality of service features like uh, any kind of latency uh, guarantees or uh, any other kind of transport 
quality of service type things that you guys support? We don't have anything beyond that at this point, um, but it is always something that, you know, when we're talking to customers that are looking to deploy at scale, we will absolutely let those conversations guide sort of what, what sort of QoS terms that we may put, uh, put on an, on a specific customer solution or something along those lines. So, if, I mean, if you want to follow up with me over email and we can talk specifics if you, if you prefer, but um, I mean, that's kind of where we are right now. Okay. Thank you. Right. And I think with that, we're up at the top of the hour. So thanks again, everybody. Uh, it has been a while. I think the last time I spoke to Riot Lunch and Learn is actually in person, and I miss doing that. Hopefully we get to do that again. But this was uh, this was fine as a substitution. It was great to uh, get to see you all and, uh, and have a chat. Thanks so much, Brandon. And thanks to you, Rob, as well. As always, Brandon, um, you always bring information and um, you make it fun with the demos. So we appreciate that here at Riot. Um, great to have you back in the Lunch and Learn series. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you again, Brandon and Rob. Thanks everyone for being with us today. You will be able to find this recording on Riot's YouTube channel. Um, please reach out to Brandon and Rob. They provided their emails. And as always, you can contact Riot directly if you need to be connected. Thanks y'all, have a great day. Thanks everybody, bye. Bye, thank you.